Hi, welcome to the third of my Physics in the House video series, made, as you'll remember, primarily for the University of the Third Age in Canterbury, but obviously open to anybody who's interested. So today I want to look at water boiling. It sounds a fairly mundane thing, but you'll notice whenever you put your kettle on, particularly if you've got an electric kettle, there's a whole series of noises associated with heating the water up from room temperature to boiling. And it's that that I want to look at. There's a lot of really interesting science involved uh, in, um, in boiling water. And we can draw that out by not only just looking and listening carefully to what's going on, but actually trying to record the sounds and think about the frequencies involved. And in the process, we'll, I hope, understand a little bit about what makes water special uh, in a general sense. And I'm going to return to that at some stage uh, in the future. There's a lot, I think, that we can learn now, though, simply by boiling a kettle of water. So let's see how it goes. OK, so we're going to watch the kettle boil now. Um, I've got a camera hovering over the top with the lid off. The um, white stuff you can see in the bottom is calcium carbonate. It comes out of the water naturally in hard water areas um, like um, Canterbury, for instance. It's entirely harmless. Um, so we're just going to watch really as the bubbles form and what the noise of this kettle sounds like. So I'm going to put the power on now and we'll just watch. And very soon you're going to see bubbles forming over the hottest part of the heating element. Then I'll stop talking and get going. Okay, so we're going That's it, watching a kettle boil. Sorry about the clatter near the end there, that was my little um, LED torch falling off its stand. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the science that's associated um, with boiling our kettle. And there's an awful lot we can pull out of it. I suppose the first thing we need to do is to think about why um, a kettle takes electricity and um, converts it into heat, which warms up the water. Electricity won't do that if you pass it through uh, a lot of materials. So take, for instance, 
a mains cable, right? Ordinary bit of copper wire. If I measure the resistance of that wire, which turns out to be uh, an important parameter, so let's turn the little meter on here, then you'll see that the needle flicks right over to the side there and is registering, you probably won't be able to see the numbers, but it's registering zero. So to all intents and purposes, and certainly as far as my little meter is concerned, this piece of copper wire uh, has um, insignificant levels of resistance to electricity. That's why it doesn't heat up. We put our um, current in to one side, uh, one end rather, of our wire, and it comes out the other side as it were, having lost very little uh, energy at all. And that's actually really very useful for obvious reasons. Uh, and the reason for it is that inside all metals, and copper is just one example, there's a whole array uh, of um, electrons, negatively charged uh, particles, that are very easy to move around. They're essentially free-flowing in our metal. But if we look at the element inside our kettle, for instance, um, not that this is an accurate representation, but if we pass an electrical current in uh, one side of this, um, the electrons in our current um, actually collide with all the atoms inside the heating element inside, and in the process, lose energy. So our electrical current gives up some of its energy uh, to this heating element and heats the element up, which in turn uh, heats the water. Now, if you have a look at your kettle, probably uh, on a little label underneath or somewhere near where um, it connects to the power supply, you should find a label giving you its rating. Um, the kettle that I'm using uh, for today's little video uh, says that it has an energy rating uh, of 2000 500 watts, all right, which is fairly typical. Anywhere between two and 3,000 watts is um, pretty typical for a kettle. But what does that mean? Well, a watt is short for joules per second. Well, seconds we all know. Uh, a joule, however, is simply a measure of energy. So what this number is giving us is the rate at which energy is being deposited into the water inside the kettle. Uh, and this is quite a large uh, number. This is a lot of energy being uh, deposited per second. If you want to get a bit of a feel for what a joule is, um, get some food out of your larder or your fridge and have a look at the um, labels on the side. It'll often have energy values written in calories, but often also uh, alongside there'll be energy values for that food in joules as well, or kilojoules, which is just a thousand joules. OK, um, so because that number is so big and it takes a lot of energy to boil, um, a teapot's worth of water, say, uh, that's pretty good reason for not overfilling your kettle. If you're energy conscious, really only put in the amount of water that you're going to need. But that's an aside. Let's go to the boiling process itself now. Um, and there are different stages to this, and each stage is associated with a different sort of sound. So the first uh, sound that um, emits comes from something I suppose we might loosely describe as trapped air. Uh, and that's um, small, microscopically small sometimes, pockets of air that are trapped in imperfections on the inside surface of your kettle. So in the kettle I've used, for instance, uh, there's a coating of calcium carbonate all over the place, which is a fairly porous material. Uh, and it holds a lot of air trapped inside it. 
So what happens when the element is switched on and begins to generate heat uh, that it's pumping into the water, those bits of the water nearest the element, so nearest the hot parts of the kettle surface, this trapped air uh, gets heated up, expands, expands a lot, um, and simply comes out from where it's been trapped. So the very first thing we get is this bubbles of this trapped air, which are then released and float to the surface and burst. So there's a bit of sound associated with that process. It's not a lot, but um, there is some. In, incidentally, uh, those of you who like the sound of babbling brooks, for instance, uh, a lot of the sound that comes from that is uh, coming from bubbles, uh, air bubbles, um, that burst as the water flows over rocks and stones and so on. Uh, so this is a phenomenon that's actually quite widespread in nature. But the next bit, and actually this is a much more noisy part of the process, is the air that's actually dissolved in the water. So inside the water we'll have all the gases that make up air. So we'll have oxygen, uh, we'll have nitrogen, for instance, there will be some carbon dioxide, there'll be all sorts of other minority components in there as well, but they're all dissolved into the water. Um, that's just the way it is, but one of the little quirks of water, and it has a lot of quirks, uh, is that it will dissolve more air when it's cooler. Sounds perverse, doesn't it? but it will actually dissolve a lot more when it's cooler. If you want to dissolve salt or sugar, for instance, into water, it's quicker and you get more in if you heat the water up. But for air, it's the other way around. Uh, and that, for instance, that's why um, um, the sea around cold parts of the globe uh, is often teeming with life that you wouldn't find elsewhere. It's also the reason why uh, if you've got fish in your garden pond, they're going to be a lot less happy uh, in a period of hot weather in the summer um, than they would in the spring or autumn for the very simple reason that the air, um, the water that they're swimming through contains far less um, oxygen, for instance, dissolved into it. So when we heat the water up, this dissolved air begins to come out of the water. Uh, and it gathers together and forms little bubbles. So we end up getting a whole series of bubbles of air being formed in our kettle uh, and being released to float up to the surface. And that actually makes a fair bit of noise. Uh, you can certainly hear that process going on if you listen very carefully. Um, so this is air coming out as the water heats up and it then disappears altogether. The really noisy part is when we've started heating the layer of water just above our heating element to 100 degrees centigrade. Okay, so we're now getting bubbles of steam forming, and thus forming close to this hot surface in the first instance. So let's have a look them from the side. We've got these little bubbles of steam forming on the hot surface and quite naturally when they get large enough they begin to move away from that bottom surface upwards into the water above in our kettle. Okay, But whilst this here might be 100 degrees centigrade or even higher if we're into the heating element. Uh, up here, um, the temperature is much less than 100 degrees. And initially, it's only going to be about room temperature. So somewhere in the region, say, uh, of 20 degrees centigrade. So our steam travels up into cooler water. And what happens then is actually quite a violent process because the steam inside those bubbles then condenses back to water. And it happens so uh, fast 
that we have, uh, in essence, what we've got going on is a series of implosions, thousands upon thousands of bubbles imploding uh, inside the water. And that makes a heck of a din. So most of the, the really loud noise that you're getting from your kettle is going to be coming from thousands of implosions as these bubbles collapse and the sides of the bubbles then basically colliding with each other uh, as the water vapour condenses again. Um, it's actually really quite, uh, as I say, quite a violent process. And I'll expand on that a little bit. I'll probably have to turn over my sheet of paper to do that. But the final phase, of course, when uh, these vapour bubbles have transferred some heat energy further up into uh, into the kettle itself, and when the convection currents that we would expect to be forming in there uh, transfer heat energy up from the filament as well, we get to a state where our water is all at um, 100 degrees centigrade, so all at its boiling point. And actually, curiously, that's where the kettle gets really relatively quiet. All of these violent events, bubbles being released and um, either bursting or imploding, all of that is over now. And we just get a rolling boil at 100 degrees centigrade. So, as I say, it's quite curious that when we get to the point where our water is, is in a sense, at its most energetic, it has all this heat energy inside it, it's actually giving off less sound. So I said I'd go back to this implosion point again, a little bit in passing. It's, it is worth doing that, um, just to show you how um, important or how violent, I suppose, this process is. So my work of art goes on the floor and we start again. Uh, one of the things that's common with water and all materials is that we have this relationship between the temperature of our material and its volume. So a conventional material will expand, its volume will go up as you warm it in the solid. All right? And then if we melt it, we get a small volume change at the melting temperature. All right? uh, and then the liquid actually continues to expand gently as we heat it up until we get to the boiling point. And then the volume goes up enormously at that point. Uh, we convert our liquid into a gas at the boiling point. And then the gas again, if we heat it, uh, the gas will continue to expand um, further on. Okay, now just in passing, uh, this is a really interesting bit for water. This is why ice floats, right? Um, because water doesn't go through this sort of process. We come up from the solid, so from ice, and then we get to this curious uh, fact that although the water normally is okay up here, we have this exaggerated bit here where actually um, the water near the melting point is actually more dense than the solid. All right, so this is our melting point. So this is liquid, this is solid, this is ice. And this happens at a temperature of about four degrees centigrade. So the dense part of our garden pond, for instance, or a lake or whatever it is, uh, will be sinking to the bottom. Um, and that leaves the ice uh, available uh, at a lower density to take the position at the top of the pond. And it's why ponds generally don't uh, um, freeze solid, they freeze from the top and then down a certain distance. 
Anyway, that was an aside. Uh, the key part I wanted to tell you about was actually this bit and why it's so, uh, the implosion process in our kettle is so important. Because this change in volume is actually a factor of 1600. It's huge. So for every litre of water we've got in our kettle, if we boil, boil it away into steam, we actually get 1,600 litres of steam uh, at 100 degrees centigrade. Uh, it's huge. Um, so that's telling us about the separation between our water molecules. It's actually um, a little bit more than 10 times further apart when they're in steam uh, at 100 degrees centigrade uh, than when they're um, at the boiling point as a liquid. So the converse is also true. If we cool that water vapour down again, so they're coming up, remember, these bubbles of water vapour into cooler water and the water vapour is condensing, the bubble is collapsing, we've actually changed the volume by this factor of 1600. In the case of our bubbles condensing, the volume has gone down in a very short space of time by this huge factor. And that's what causes the implosion. And that's why the implosion is so energetic and the noise is so very, very loud. And I think that's about it. That will do nicely. So until next time, enjoy now the physics of making a cup of tea by boiling a kettle of water. Bye. Okay, now I'm going to boil the kettle again, but this time I'm going to try and monitor the sound uh, using the sound card on my laptop and um, an oscilloscope app that I installed a while back. Those of you who came to my U3A sound talk will have seen this thing in operation before already. Um, but um, for the rest of you, what you can see on the screen at the moment is obviously the waveform associated with my voice. But actually, um, I'm going to keep quiet during the kettle boiling process. And we're going to have a look at that. I'm going to first look at um, the frequency, actually, of the sound that's coming off. So I'm going to switch through to frequency now. Uh, on this oscilloscope setting. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to switch the um, kettle on now and we'll see what happens.
and that was it. So you can see we started up here, higher frequency, lots of intensity, and then more and more building down here. And then finally, when we get to the uh, rolling boil, we're at much lower frequencies. We're down at this end. Um, so that's boiling a kettle. Okay, one very simple follow-up we can do to this is just listen now to the difference that boiling water can make, getting rid of all those dissolved gases inside. So on the uh, one side of the screen here I've got water straight from the tap and on the other side this has been previously boiled. Okay, so just listen to the sound that we get when I tap it. Hopefully you can hear that one is quite different to the other. If I tap this fresh poured water, I get a relatively dull sound compared to tapping the glass with the boiled water in. The difference is purely due to the dissolved gases uh, in this straight from the tap one.